Good morning and welcome to the True Disciples broadcast. For the next 30 minutes, my goal is to inspire you, educate you, challenge you, and hopefully for some activate you into a confidence of taking your Christian faith and engaging your culture. My name is Pastor Kevin Baird, and I am the lead pastor of Legacy Church in Charleston, South Carolina. I'm also the executive director of the South Carolina Pastors Alliance. It's a network now of over 275 pastors, and we're growing in South Carolina, linked together all over our state, as well as alliances in other states, helping the clergy use their influence for faith, family, and freedom. I am so glad that you tuned into the broadcast today. It is the Christmas season, and this week and next week, in fact, we're trusting all through the rest of the month of December, we're going to be sharing with you some Christmas messages, hopefully things that will uh, be a blessing and an inspiration to you. Uh, If you'd like to know a little bit more about uh, Legacy Church, the church I pastor here in Charleston, South Carolina, you can go to LegacyChurchSC.org and you can get all the information you would like about us. And we invite you to come visit us. You can get the directions in the Charleston region to come to a service we would love to to have you come and be with us. The message we're going to share in two parts, beginning this week as well as next week, is a message entitled, What Can We Learn from the Family Tree? It's in a series that I entitled, uh, Christmas Odds and Ends. I'm going to be preaching on the passages that rarely get talked about through the Christmas season. We all know about Mary and Joseph, the baby Jesus. We know angels, shepherds, wise men all the main characters, but there are passages that are found in the Christmas narrative that rarely get taught on or talked about. And this message has to deal with the genealogy. Now, don't turn the radio off. You may say, what good could come from a genealogy? Well, you need to listen this morning, and you'll be amazed at what we can learn from the genealogy of Jesus. And so the first part of our message, what can we learn from the family tree is coming your way. God bless as you listen this morning. This one's an easy one this morning. Turn to Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, and turn to Matthew chapter 1. Can you find it? Matthew chapter 1. And we're going to be preaching through the Christmas season on what I entitled Christmas Odds and Ends. Christmas Odds and Ends. These are truths that get lost in the Christmas rush. There are certain passages in the Christmas account that uh, get overlooked. And so I thought this Christmas season, I'm just going to sort of clean up the Christmas story. (laughs) Isn't that nice of me? We're going to clean up the Christmas story, and I want to touch base on some things that sometimes get overlooked in the Christmas story. I have preached and taught a lot of Christmases. And I think that I've exhausted every Christmas, familiar Christmas text thoroughly. I mean, you do not imagine, you can't even imagine how when we come to the Christmas season, I say to myself, what more can be said that I've not said over 30 years? I mean, who doesn't know about Mary? Is there anyone here that really doesn't know about Mary? Or or Joseph, really, you don't know? Okay, we we won't shout any names out. Mary and Joseph, I mean, pretty familiar characters, wouldn't you say, in the Christmas story? How about angels and wise men? Which you know, they really weren't wise men. They were magi. So, but we won't get into that. That's another interesting story. Mangers, shepherds, baby Jesus. I mean, it's a really familiar story, this Christmas business. So for me, preaching Christmas to a congregation is like trying to find your dad a present. I mean, what do you get a guy that has everything? A gift card, that's exactly right. That's probably why I should have just given you just a CD tape or something. But really, what do you say say to a congregation that's probably heard a lot with regards to Christmas? So I decided I'm going to gather up some odds and ends in the Christmas story. I'm going to just pull out some texts that rarely get mentioned or taught, and I want to just clean up the Christmas story with these odds and ends. And this morning we're going to start on what is often called the first Sunday or the first Advent Uh, Sunday of Christmas with the message, what can we learn from the family tree? What can we learn from the family tree? So if you have your Bibles, Matthew 
chapter 1, you ought to be able to find this, verse 1, it says this. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now get ready. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. And how many of you know for about the next 10 verses you got a lot of begotten going on? I mean there are names in here I can't even pronounce. Uh, Judah begot Perez and Zerah and Tamar and Hezron and Ram and Amadab and I just won't go any further. A lot of begotten going on. And we go through all of these begats, through all of these verses until we finally get down to verse 16. So I will spare you from all the names of the list of begats to verse 16 in that same chapter. And it says, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. It would be really interesting to preach a message on whether or not 14 generations after that, what significant thing happened, but we're not going to go there this morning. But I do want to just share with you what I entitled, uh, What Can We Learn? from the family tree. There's a song that was made years ago that sums up, at least for me, genealogies. The song talks about a widow who remarried and her grown daughter later married her new husband's father. Now each of these couples had a child. And so the song, and undoubtedly it was a country song, went something like this. This made my dad my son-in-law. My daughter was my mother because she was my father's wife. Father's wife then had a son and he became my grandchild for he was my daughter's son. My wife is now my mother's mother. Now if my wife is my grandmother then I'm her grandchild and as a husband of my grandmother I'm my own grandpa. In fact, I think that was the name of the song. I'm my own grandpa. Now, in the day we live in, that doesn't sound so foreign, does it? I mean, families can be a really confusing thing. Still, all of that being said, I think there's a part of us that is very interested in our family tree. I mean, they even have websites now, you know, Ancestry.com. We've even, in the Baird household, been to Ancestry.com to try to find your lineage and your household and work on your genealogy because deep down inside we want to know the history of our family there's something about knowing our roots there's something about knowing where we came from and and personally I'd like to know what kind of people my ancestors were to know what kind of struggles they went through to know how they came to this country how they ended up where they ended up how I got where I am you know were they in jail you know were they notable people I mean who who's to say who's in the family tree but whenever you study this, the most amazing thing is how unlikely it is really that all of us are here. Think about it. If each and every one of your ancestors had not met and produced each and every one of your ancestors when they did, you would not be here. Take away one husband. Take away one wife. Put together two other people somewhere down the line and you would not exist. So tracing back your family tree is to me at least a lesson of how amazing God works and at the same time how uncertain life is. Of course, you could argue that you're here because you're here. It's just a matter of chance or coincidence. But imagine if you were trying to ensure that a child would be born generations and generations in the future. If you had to be in charge of putting all of that together, think of how impossible that might be. And that brings us to the text that I read to you this morning. Why? Why put a genealogy into the account of Christ's birth? Why spend any time teaching on a genealogy? Come on, pastor. There's so many other really important, practical, relevant verses. Why did you read to us this morning a genealogy? All a genealogy has are names. They're hard to pronounce names. I don't know these people. I'm not even sure I care about these people. I don't see where that has any impact on my life. I don't, I don't get what would even 
be remotely trying to be communicated here. It seems to me it has no purpose to talk about it when you have such an amazing thing going on through the rest of the Christmas story. Well, I just want you to put the brakes on here because I believe that God's saying something even in the midst of the Christmas story that has incredible impact and relevancy to all of our lives. Why the genealogy? I tell you why. It's because the gospel according to Matthew was written primarily for a Jewish audience. Matthew was trying to reach the Jews. And in order to do that, a Jewish person would have some initial questions in their mind with regards to a book that was written to them about a person that's now being called the Messiah. A Jew, because of how their culture is and how they grew up, would have certain questions. Questions like, well, if he's the Messiah, <clears throat> then who really is this guy? Where did he come from? If he's the Messiah, well, then what connection does he have to the patriarchs and to David and to Abraham and to all the prophecies that are mentioning him? What's his background? What's his pedigree? I mean, if we're to believe he's the Messiah, he, he should have a, a pretty good resume to bring to the table. These questions would have been relevant, obviously, for any person, but it's even more important for one who is supposed to be a king because all of us know kings come through a family. Is that not right? Kings don't come by voting. Kings come through a lineage, a lineage that must be royal. And so the Jewish reader would want to see this lineage. They would want to see, is this Messiah moving through the kingly lineage that God had spoken of through the millennia? And I know because I do the same thing, and I know most of you probably do too. When we read the Bible, we see a genealogy and we simply go, skip that. I'm going to get on to some other verses here. So we, we skip read the genealogy. We, we speed read the genealogy. I don't know many of you that have spent untold hours at night pondering the genealogies of the Bible. I'm going to meditate on all of these begots. Let's see, begot, begot. What could God be saying to me? in the midst of all this begotten. There's some of you young couples, married couples, maybe that begot is a word for you. You need to get on begotten. And, uh... <laughs> but as I began to read that, I thought to myself, there are some important things here. So I just want to share with you seven lessons from the family tree. Seven lessons from the family tree. These are just things that just sort of leapt out to me as I was reading the Christmas story again that really began to speak to me, and I think they'll speak to you too. Seven lessons from the family tree. Number one is this. God works generationally. God works generationally. The reason this is important is because not everything God has planned gets worked out in a few days or a week. Have you found that out? Have you found out that serving God doesn't mean that 24 hours later after you pray your prayer, everything's fine, it's okay, your need's met, the answer has arrived? You see, it's important to be reminded that God has some plans and God has some things on His heart that He's doing generationally to bring about victory for His church and His people. He has a much longer view than most of us have. I mean, most of us have a view basically to the weekend. I mean, we start work on Monday, and our vision is for the next weekend. In fact, a lot of people in the world, their vision is where they're going to go party, who they're going to go hang out with, where they're going to go. Maybe if, maybe if they have a really big vision, they'll begin to envision their vacation, which is maybe six months away. And that's how most of us do it. We, we especially here in America, are very, are, 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 are very uh, 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 small, and we're very... Uh, just defined in small ways with our vision. But God, He's eternal, and, and He has this way longer view. He has things that He started years ago, and He's working through generations to bring to pass His Word and His will. I mean, to me, that's amazing, especially when you consider human beings. I mean, God is moving through generations. It's not that God is slow. You see, we think God is always slow with us. And I've taught on this before. You know, the Bible says God is not slack concerning his promise, as, as some men count slackness. So God is not slow like we count slow. God moves according to the fullness of time. God moves when things are in order. God moves according to a timetable. And, and his plans involve nations. And his plan involves global glory and global takeover. His, his plans involve redemption of millions upon billions of people. His 
plans are pretty big, folks. And he's working through human beings and he's moving generationally because, because God is not subject to the same clock as you and I are subject to. We look at the clock, even this morning, you'll look at the clock and you'll say, Pastor, remember what time it is? Lunch. The Baptists are beating us. We're tied to time and calendars and watches and clocks and, and we want things to move in a certain way, shape, or form and God is not bound by these things. He doesn't even conceive. God, God cannot even conceive in that framework. That's why the writer said a day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years is as a day. <laughs> so if you ever hear the word of the Lord tell you, that he'll get to it in a day. Just keep that in mind, what he may mean. I'm reminded that it took three generations. It took Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob before God raised up a world changer by the name of Joseph. Three generations to raise up a world changer that would eventually uh, be taken into Egypt with his gifts and his skills and it was there that he would impact the whole nation. And through the man Joseph, that whole nation was blessed. And, and Israel was ultimately helped and blessed as well. You see, not everything happens overnight. We want God to change things overnight. We want God to change things in our nation with the next election. Oh God, we'll just, the next election, we'll just vote somebody better in. And it's all fixed there. Do you really believe that? Do any of us believe that? No. That is why we, as believers, while I believe Jesus can come really at any moment, the Bible says that we're to occupy until He comes. And we need to think generationally because I really do think He could come in the relative near future. But this much I know, if He chooses not to come, I've got to set something up for generations to come. So are you willing to be a link in the chain of God's purpose? All of those names, the begot and the name, the begot and the name, they were links in the chain of God's purpose. And I want to ask you, are you willing to be a link in the chain of God's purpose? You see, there's this bigger chain that's being produced. Will you be a link in that chain? Let me ask you. In fact, a chain is only as good as its what? Weakest? How, how, are you the weak link? Or are you the strong link? See, all of us here are a link in the chain of God's purposes. And you need to remember that God has something greater going on. That's pretty relevant, isn't it? Yes. I mean, that's in the Christmas story, number two. God values individuals. I was just reading through that genealogy and I thought, look at all those names. God knows people by name. You are not a nameless faceless person in the sea of humanity. It doesn't mean that maybe you have a great scope of friendships or your circle of influence is gigantic, but let me tell you something. You know the greatest influencer of all. His name is Jesus. God knows who you are. God knows your name. You are standing in a line of purpose through the centuries that God is orchestrating to bring his purposes to pass and bring glory to his name. Is that not remarkable? Look at yourself in the mirror and say to yourself, that's remarkable because that's me. A genealogy actually emphasizes what we all know and that is everybody's unique. God uses that uniqueness to further his greater purposes. You and I wouldn't even be worshiping here today had it not been for amazingly unique people all along the way. You and I would not be uh, a Pentecostal or, or, or charismatic in our, our perspectives had it not been for a one-eyed African-American man by the name of William Seymour who got kicked out of the Church of the Nazarene because they didn't want anything to do with him. So he went down to this makeshift church on Azusa Street and he preached the glory down and the Spirit was poured out and something started that day that everybody thought was an anomaly but God used that man in order to start something that has 600 million people testifying today that they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that pretty amazing? Yes. I think that's pretty amazing. Who would have thought? 
God is intricately involved in people's lives. It's real, personal. He knows you. Have you ever heard of the phrase, I've heard this before, especially those of you that are out there in the business world. That maybe you've even used it. You've heard the phrase in a business deal when people will say, hey, 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 it, it, it's nothing personal, just business. Nothing personal, just business. We know what God says. God says it this way. He says, it's not business, it's real personal. It's real personal. He knows you by name. He knows individuals and he values them. That's pretty relevant, isn't it? You get that out of a genealogy. Number three, this one you'll love. Number three, it's not all about you. I got that out of the genealogy. This may never have occurred to you, but it could be that you and I are a part of something bigger than us. We are part of a lineage that God is doing something greater than you. You see, all these people in this genealogy were a part of something beyond themselves. It wasn't all about them. Now, a lot of their stories were remarkable. In fact, you'll read some of the names and you'll recognize some of the names and, and you will begin to think about some of their stories and you will say to yourself, man, that's a remarkable story, what God did in them and what God did for them. And, and truly... The same could be said of any one of us in this room. It's amazing what God will do personally in your life to begin to forge your story. But it's really important that you remember that as much as God is forging a story in you, it's not all about you. You've often heard things to the effect, I would hope, that there would have never been a Moses had there not been a mom who valued her son to send him afloat in the Nile to save his life. Wouldn't you say mom was pretty important? You ever wonder who Billy Graham's Sunday school teacher was? I mean, I would think they're a pretty important person. Who mentored Luther? Who taught Calvin? We never hear much about even Susanna Wesley. You know, Susanna Wesley had about 20 kids. Two of them were John Wesley and Charles Wesley. You hear a lot about them, don't you? I mean, but without her, there would have been no Wesley brothers. You see, we might be preparing the ground for something far beyond us, and that's really hard for some of us. Because some of us have egos and some of us have personality types that we really do believe that the universe is sort of like centered right here. <laughs> that everything sort of just spins around our lives. Listen, listen, one of the most liberating things that can happen to you is when you begin to see that you're not the center of the universe and that God is preparing something that's far beyond you, but yet he wants to use you as one of the links to get to that greater purpose. We have a relationship with Jesus, not just because it helps us, but we have a relationship with Jesus because it's all about him. You see, this is one of the errors of our current era. We, we preach and we teach to people that Jesus wants to save you because you're such a mess. Jesus wants to save you because you really need a savior. And you don't want to go to hell, and you want fire insurance. We preach Jesus in such a way that it's all about you. You've tried everything else that's not working, try Jesus. You don't have a job, try Jesus. He'll get you a job. You need bills paid, try Jesus. He'll prosper you. And we have done, we have done a disservice to our world by preaching in Jesus whom we think is all about us. Do you know what the Bible says as to the reason Jesus saves us? The Bible says that we are saved for the praise of his glory. You were saved for the sole purpose of giving God glory. He didn't save you to make you sleep better. He didn't save you to do all the hundreds of things you want Jesus to do. He saved you so that you would be a walking, breathing testament to the glory of God that you deserved hell, that you deserved a wrecked life, that you deserved the worst of everything, but God saved you to the praise of His glory. It's not about you. It's all about Him. It's about Him. I heard a sermon one time. It was a great sermon. And the title of it, God is for God. <laughs> I like that. That's what he's for. He's, he's for his purposes. Listen, you know what God is for? He's not for you per se. He's for his purposes in you. Makes a big difference. See, because if you think it's just for you, then you think somehow we can't get along without you. No, the reason you're needful is because of God's purposes in you. That's what he's working for. 
The minute you think it's just about you is the minute God will come along and he'll say this, watch my kingdom go on without you. That's liberating too. So God is preparing some things and it's not all about you and it's not all about me. Well, that's a good place to pause this morning and we'll pick the message up next week at this same spot and we will conclude what we've been sharing with you. What can we learn from the family tree? You know, genealogies are interesting things, aren't they? In fact, for those of you that may have read through your Bibles and you get to uh, genealogies or long lists of names, oftentimes we'll just skip through them. And uh, hopefully, listening to this message, uh, you'll see that uh, even through a long list of names that are hard to pronounce and maybe you don't know, that uh, there's something that we can pull out of that uh, that can minister and inspire us. I'm so glad you tuned in today. Uh, Again, we hope that uh, you make this a normal part of your Sunday morning. We would love to be able to greet you personally at Legacy Church. Uh, We meet in the uh, Tanger Outlet area here in uh, North Charleston, actually. And you can go to our website at www.legacychurchsc, like South Carolina.org, and you can get directions, information, whatever you may need, and we would be more than happy to visit with you. Of course, we have a social media presence on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, you can pick up this message as well as others on our YouTube site, Legacy Media. And uh, again, we would just love to be able to be in contact with you. Let me also say that uh, along with that, um, we just have some great uh, happenings through the Christmas season that are going to be taking place, and we would want you to be a part of that. And so uh, contact us, and uh, our contact numbers are very, uh, our contact sites, excuse me, are very much the same as the website. It's uh, LegacyChurchSC at AOL.com, at like sc at aol.com just about couldn't get uh, that e address out to you well we do appreciate you uh listening this morning we're going to pick it up next time uh our time is swiftly running out but we want you to make sure during this christmas season you know a lot of people want to just overlook the fact that uh this is the christmas season it's not just a, a holiday season but this season represents the, the breakthrough of our Savior. And so we say Merry Christmas. So to uh, my house, to your house, from this broadcast, through the radio, to your ears, I want you to have a very, very Merry Christmas. I want you, until next time, to keep walking the walk and make sure you keep being a true disciple. This is Pastor Kevin Baird uh, wishing you a great day. God bless. God bless.